Hey, peers, welcome back to season two of the Modern Myths podcast. I'm Vince Ventura, artistic director of 12 Peers Theater and your host for the Modern Myths podcast. Today, I'm joined by Alex Kump, playwright of It's Just Something That Happened, which honestly, to be fair, was one of my favorite submissions from this round of the Modern Myths podcast. I think it has such a cool vibe and the language is just so organic. If you haven't listened to it yet, swing back around. It's the episode just before this. Give it a listen. Now, without further ado, I want to welcome Alex. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me, bud. So let's get into it. Where did this play come from? What inspired you to write this play? Um, well... I started writing this play uh, maybe a year or two after I got out of college. So uh, I was probably like 23, 24, and I was in that weird phase where I had uh, – I just moved to Chicago and didn't know anyone here and kind of was like sort of in contact with some of my friends. And I was really kind of dealing with the idea of – friends you keep in your life and who sticks and who goes and why you stick around with your friends. That's a big question that we all kind of have to wrestle with at that point, huh? Totally. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's very, it's very weird. So it's the people you think that wouldn't stick around are the people you end up with these like great lifelong relationships with. So I think that the, the direct impetus for this play was actually, uh, a night that me and one of my friends were driving around when I visited home, uh, around the holidays and we just started like spitballing this idea of a play and uh we were gonna write it together and then she uh kind of frankied out and <laughs> uh that's fair that's fine we all got lives man but uh then i kind of took it and made it my own and it's a it's a story that i've uh, an archetype of a story that i've been really looking to tell for a while and i'm happy that i got to do it I think it really plays well too and i think it feels like i said before organic to that period of my life and I don't know, I heard a quote once that said your your success is determined like 50% by the people you hang out with. Oh. And that, you know, you are who you hang with in some ways. And that that really struck me in this play. Uh, who is supportive, who's not supportive in your life? Uh, who Frankie's out, so to speak? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why the arcade? Did you spend a lot of time in arcades growing up? No, um, I think that uh, I'm just really... I like the idea of a play that is set in one location. Um, it's always a fun challenge. There's a lot of, um, you know, multi-space places and uh, in theater these days, and that's great. But I like to challenge myself because I could write a movie if I wanted to write a movie. So sometimes I like to try to pick that one spot um, and stick there. Uh, and I think that it does sort of have this... It matches in tone with sort of like the the theme of coming of age of the story because you're in this like decrepit arcade that no one like really goes to anymore and yeah. it's going to close down soon and like same. Uh, so it's it's I think it's a really cool place to do it. I also decided that I should uh, as a new playwright should write a play that no one will ever produce because no one's going to pay for arcade machines. <laughs> The thought had occurred to me, but as a producer, I do thank you for setting it in one location yeah. and not many. <laughs> uh, the, the, hey, the arcade machines are solvable, right? The script has legs. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's a good, That's... it's a great play. And I love the parallel between uh, an archaic hey. place that we socialize versus archaic social engagements that we have. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so. You said you were writing with a partner. Is that a typical process for you? Or oh, not point? at all. No, I. Um, it was really more of just uh, the night of like hanging out and be like, "Hey, what if we told this story?" And then kind of took that, adapted to my own likes. Usually, for my own writing process, it's me sitting alone in my room writing something with a cup of tea at night. Um, uh, for this play, I actually did something a little different than I normally do. I had just uh, taken a class with the New Futurists in Chicago, and our entire uh, class decided that we wanted to like start a writing group. So we had a writing group that we were meeting up every week and bringing in new material in various uh, forms and formats. And I kind of just brought in a scene a week from this play, and over the course of you know ten weeks or however long it is, just wrote an entire play, which is super new for me. Uh, and that was really fun. That's amazing. That's a, a quick turnaround time for sure. Yeah, totally. I like to let uh, plays sort of like sit in my brain for a long time. Um, Stephen King likes to talk about uh, how he has like a file cabinet of images in his mind that he can kind of like pull things from. And I kind of do the same uh, with like storylines and like, oh, this would be a fun story to tell. Let me kind of think about that over time. And then when it's ready, I can kind of like 
shoot it out. Yeah, but it's not. Uh, it's the the process is a lot of thinking beforehand. I think, and I'm not a playwright. I've done nearly every other thing you could do in the <laughs> theater for Twelve Peers specifically, but I've never written a play. Uh, but I, I I imagine it's a lot like your process is a lot like what David Lynch speaks of when he talks about fishing. He meditates and fishes for ideas, and when they're ready, yeah. they'll bite. Um, yeah. I am down for in comparison to me to David Lynch, <laughs> so please go for it. I uh, honestly, David, if you're listening, we are huge fans. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> honestly, though, uh, are there any other people who inspire you um, besides David Lynch? Of course, any playwrights yeah, that you have? Totally. Um, my my go to is sort of Annie Baker. Um, she was one of the plays when I was in college. I went to uh, to. Uh, Clark University in Worcester and some alums from that school started a theater company in Boston called Company One. And they're a really cool progressive theater company. And we went on a field trip to see The Aliens. And what a great play. It's been on it's, our short list for years. Yeah, it is just an amazing play. Like when you open up the script of a play and the, the first uh, note from the playwright is like, hey, a third of this play should be silence. Yeah. It's like, oh, oh, holy shit. Um, and I remember like <laughs> sitting there in the audience being like, oh, this is what theater can be. Yeah. Like, it doesn't have to be, you know, straight white people walking around. I mean, it is straight white people walking around in that play. But, you know, it doesn't have to be like, you know, whose fidelity problems are here. It's Mm -hmm. you can have people just like live as actual people on stage and have it be unpretentious, but so profound at the same time. I think that uh, that's really insightful. I think that what's interesting about most of her plays is that nothing is overtly theatrical and that's where the theatricality comes in. I hope that makes sense. Oh, totally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and not to and be I'm, too lugubrious with my praise of your play, but I think the first, play continue, that I, yes. <laughs> the first play that I thought of when I read this play was the flick, not in terms of structure, not in terms of location, but there's some intangible quality that you've managed to capture about, I don't know, honest human experience that I think was the strength and the legs of the flick. So I don't want to say that it's derivative of it in any way, but I do think that it's captured something that made the flick so compelling. Uh, thank you. That's like one of the best compliments I could ever receive. I, I think it's also really interesting because as much as I love Annie Baker, my other like major theatrical inspiration is the complete opposite. Um, I really love Sarah Kane. Um, okay. I think she might be the best playwright I've ever lived and that's like a loaded sentence, and I'm sorry if I'm offending no, everyone no. who likes Sam Shepard. But, uh, <laughs> but what I really love about Sarah Kane is that she's able to show you these like horrific and graphic and dark images, and then you feel you feel them, but then you also find the humanity in them, and they become beautiful. Yeah, I definitely remember a visceral reaction to reading Sarah Kane. I don't think I've ever seen anything she's written produced. Yeah. But when I read her, um, it it's a gut punch. Totally, yeah. I um when I was in college, uh I did lighting design for a production of 448 Psychosis. And that was another one of those theatrical moments. I was like, oh holy shit, this is this is what theater can be that just played in Pittsburgh, and I'm sorry to say I missed it, but shout out to Off the Wall Theater for doing consistently good plays. Come on off the wall. Cool. So we got a couple of things that you are involved in. So aside from being a playwright and a performance artist and jack of all trades, you're going to be performing in verses at the Drinking and Writing Theater twice weekly in Chicago where you live. And you'll also be writing and performing a full-length performance art piece in April, which uh, is coming up, and you will be doing that with your partner. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, He's a good friend of mine. Uh, His name is Taylor Dorsett. Um, We are also doing this through Drinking and Writing Theater, which is uh, a wonderful theater in Chicago. Super excited that I get to be an ensemble member and work there. Um, But we are going to attempt to catalog the death of every writer ever. And use that as a a kind of springboard to talk about uh, our own experiences with death and uh, mortality. And it's going to be really fun and good. And it's not written yet. And I'm very anxious. And (laughs) I'm super interested in this. There's so many different ways that could go. Uh, As an artist, I oftentimes fear that I will be forgotten. Um, What a cool way to make sure that none of those people who whose shoes you're walking in, whose footsteps you're following in are forgotten. Totally, yeah. I think there's a really, there's the sort of like mythology about like the tragic writer death. 
yeah. that is super interesting. You know, you talk about like Tennessee Williams choked on a bottle cap. Virginia Woolf like loaded her pockets up with rocks and walked into the ocean. Like that fuck. takes that takes a lot of. Uh... Yeah, you got to really want to do that. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And, like, so many uh, writers have their own kind of, like, crazy fucking death story that uh, it's it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, let's wrap it up by having you talk to some young writers out there who are not yeah. yet dead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what kind of advice would you say, being a young writer, Trying to get your work out there in the field. What are some challenges that you face? What are some solutions to those challenges? What advice do you have? Um, so uh, I think my big piece of advice is that uh, when you're you're getting notes from people, you can always ignore something that one person says. But the second more than one person starts saying something, uh, it's probably something you should listen to. I second uh, that for yeah. sure. Um, I also think that um, you need to feel enabled to do your own stuff. Uh, don't think that you need to buy into any sort of like theater aristocracy in order to like create and perform and do anything you need to do. Um, it's fake. You know, there's dozens of theaters out there that like to sell you that idea, but really at the end of the day, like you can build yourself a small artistic community, like get friends together, buy them a pizza and say like, Hey, can we read this new play that I wrote? And then talk about it. That is what I tell everyone. you got to make your own opportunities. Don't wait for someone to hand you something because it's probably not going to come. you got to get yeah. out there and hustle. Exactly. Uh, and, you know, like work, you know, work, pay your dues. Like that's its own thing in its own way. But also like you can pay your dues by carving your own way out and it's going to be hard. But if you don't want to put in the hard work, find something else to do. If it were easy, everybody would do it. Exactly. Yeah. Alex, I cannot tell you how thrilled I am to have you on this podcast. You you have such insight and and skill. You're wise beyond your years, my friend. I used to hate oh, it when people said you. that to me. <laughs> oh no, I mean, I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm really I'm really looking forward to sharing this with our audience and I, I think that this play opening season 2 of the podcast, I, I couldn't have asked for a better one. So, thank oh. you for being here with us today and uh oh. we hope to do yeah. it again. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. And that's it for our interview with Alex Kump, playwright of It's Just Something That Happened. Before we go, we just want to remind you, if you liked It's Just Something That Happened, if you like the Modern Myths podcast, be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast service. Also, be sure to check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash 12 Theater. We have a whole bunch of cool subscription levels, a whole bunch of cool bonuses like behind-the-scenes access, early access to episodes, and your support helps us continue to release these podcasts. The Modern Myths Podcast is produced by 12 Piers Theatre, executive producer Vince Ventura, producers Sarah Fisher, Matt Henderson, and Marcus Savage. It's Just Something That Happened was written by Alex Kump and directed by Reginald Douglas, featuring Moira Quigley as Frankie, Matt Henderson as Eli, Ryan Patrick Kearney as Christopher, John Feitner as Billy, Alex Manalo as Death, Christopher Collier reading Stage Directions. The recording location was generously provided to us by Time Sys Corporation. And you can visit us at 12peers.org or patreon.com slash 12peers theater. As always, thank you for listening.